Okay, so I know many of you guys know that I rent a place in KL, right? For a period of time. Well, physically, now I'm back in Singapore. But during the past year, before COVID was a thing, I was living in KL and I rented my first apartment of my life, right? And there are many things that happened. Uh, some things better, some things not so good. But over time, I learned. I learned some stuff and I have some friends who also rent their own apartment. And I asked them for some tips and some ideas as to how to become a better renter. All right, so today I'm going to share with you essentially three tips to be a better first-time renter. Right, so yeah, I hope you learned something useful. Welcome back. Hey guys, we have finally launched our newsletter you've been asking for. Head over to thefinancialcoconut.com to drop your email to be part of our weekly TFC newsletter. You'll receive our podcast transcript, other resources to level up your financial literacy game and some good ideas to incorporate some fun into your week. So make sure to check your various inboxes every Tuesday morning and sign up today at thefinancialcoconut.com. See ya! Good morning, everyone. I welcome you to another day with The Financial Coconut. In our podcast, we're debunking financial myths, discovering best financial practices, and discussing financial strategies that fits our unique life. You get it. Ultimately empowering us to create a life we love while managing our finances well. And today, we're going to talk about three tips for a first-time home renter. Okay, in Singapore, it's not very common for uh, young adults to rent an apartment or rent a room or rent, you know, somewhere. So for a lot of people, this idea of renting a space is very, like, very questionable. And, and honestly, a lot of our parents have not rented a space ever, right, when they were younger. And um, in, in, in essence, renting is a very foreign concept. Right? Especially amongst the Chinese people, I think there is an idea of owning a place. It's always about saving money to buy a place, saving money to buy a place. And we've talked about this um, extensively in some of the earlier episodes where one of the things I think it is very good for you to consider having is to go out and rent a place, right? Because when you rent your own place, you learn about your likes, your dislikes, you throw away all the arbitraries, right? Like like what I said before, like you think you you love a pool, right? You think you're like, wow, it'll be so amazing if you live in a condo, that's just got a pool. But then after you shiv in and you realize, damn, I don't use it every day. In fact, I maybe use it once a week or twice a week, right? So it is interesting to understand yourself better and renting your own space gives you that information and understanding before you decide that, okay, I actually in my life, as part of my apartment, as part of my house, I want this, 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 right? So when you have that clarity, when you buy the apartment, when you buy your own property, it is much clearer. It fits your needs in a more accurate you know, standpoint. And I do encourage people to try and rent your own place to get to know yourself better, know your quirks, and just experience life you know, um, away from your family, right? Because that is a very good part of building your own life and your own ideologies, your own beliefs, right? So I do encourage that and I thought that, okay, because I encourage you to go and rent and a lot of you guys will probably be like first-time renters. So I thought, okay, let me just share with you some tips, you know, uh, how to be a better first-time renter. So my very first tip, right, for first-time renter is to only rent for a year. I don't rent for more than that. Um, also, don't try to rent for less than that. I think a year is a very good time for you to understand yourself, understand your life. Of course, um, if you rent longer, sometimes um, things are a bit cheaper. And also, if you rent longer, it's... Uh, how do I put it? It gives you a lot more certainty as to you can develop your life around this space because when you live in a place, you will start to develop your own life around the community, around the neighbourhood, right? If you live... Let's say if you live in like Upper Thompson, right, then you will be visiting the Makan areas around Upper Thompson, you know, then there will be a certain way of life. There's a Bisham Park, you know, and if you choose to live in Pasiris, then there will be another way of life. Or if you choose to live in like KL, there will be a different way of life. And the reality is, yes, if you have a longer lease term, two years, three years, five years, you get more confirmation that, okay, I want to live here. And um, you will be more able to develop your life there, you know, rather than having this idea that, okay, I'm just here for a year and I'll see how things go. But as a first-time renter, assuming that you don't know about the kind of place that you enjoy living, you don't know enough about yourself, 
you have a lot of like, you know, fantasy and idea <laughs> in your head. Like, wow, I must have a pool downstairs, I must have a running track, opposite must have a bar, behind must have uh, like some cafe and all sorts of stuff that you think it's, it's, um, it's what is in your head that you love and you enjoy may not be the case after you rent or right? after you start living there. Right, you was you may start to appreciate that auntie downstairs that every morning stays high, you know, or that small little corner shop, you know, with that very beautiful lady, you know, or that very happy man, you know, whatever, right? So different, different way of life uh, will exist. And when you start renting your own place, you get a much clearer view of whether is this the life you want. So to me, right, rent a year start there, right? After this one whole year, you will start to recognize yourself better. And maybe, you know, you should do that for the next few apartment too, one or two years, one or two years. And after maybe three or four rental, you will very clearly and vividly know that, okay, these are what I enjoy, right? I want to live in a place where there are lesser people, low density housing, I don't need to be very near the MRT. I'm able to cycle, you know, and I want to make sure that around me, there's a lot of, you know, makan places or around me, there's no makan places. So it's quiet. You know, all these different things, you don't know until you actually live in a place, right? So try out for that one year, have that kind of timeline to get the clarity as to what you actually like or decently get a better grasp of what you enjoy before you decide that, okay, maybe I want to continue to rent here or maybe I want to try another place and, you know, continue to get more information, get more idea of what you enjoy and what kind of life do you want to shape. Of course, that being said, it means that I'm just encouraging you to um, rent for too long just because for the convenience because yes, it is very um, much of a hassle to keep shifting and whatnot. So yeah, you know, some people would think like, I just rent for two years, three years and then, and then I'll decide, right? So to me, I would think a year is good because of all these perks but any shorter will be a lot questionable also, right? The, I think one year is about a good a good benchmark, at least from, from my personal experience and from uh, the many friends that I have that live abroad, whether is it to study or whether is it to work. I think most people agree that this one-year process gives you a decent timeline to understand yourself, understand your environment, and then make a better decision over the next few other properties that you choose to live or buy or rent. Which brings me to point number two. Okay, Point number two is that you need to set a budget and stick to it. Okay, this is what I call benchmarking. And I'll share with you a little bit of my story, my first time renting a property in Malaysia. Afterward, from our sponsor. Hey guys, so yes, I get it. Everyone wants to learn to invest and somehow believe they can be a Warren Buffett. Truth is that will probably never happen. But if we just want to become slightly better investor, making consistent 5-10% to returns, then Dividend Machine may be something to consider. Dividend Machine is a program by the fifth person our selected course partner, which focuses on helping you pick dividend-paying stocks to grow a consistent investment income or some call passive income. On top of that, with us around, you can come back and discuss and ideate with our community. So yes, for more details, check out the financialcoconut.com slash dividend. Everything is in the link below. Okay, so I think buried deep down somewhere, I have this belief about cheap and good, right? Probably it's a family thing. You want to buy something that is cheap and good, right? So what my experience when I was uh, shopping for, you know, a place to rent was that I kept wanting to find something cheaper and better, right? Which is uh, pretty cute, lah, pretty questionable because we're not buying one-off things, you know? We're not buying something on discount. We're not, we're not like buying a, like, like some fruit basket or something, right? We're actually renting a place with a market benchmark and with the ongoing expense, right? So renting a place is ongoing expense. And what I realized was I could actually already found a place that I wanted. That means I already thought like, okay, I want this place, you know? And I know that it fits my budget. Like I've set, I've set a certain budget for it as an ongoing expense, right? It's part of my budgeting for my month to month rent. And it fits the budget. It fits the bill. It fits what I want. But even then, I feel like I want to go and negotiate with the agent. I feel like I want to negotiate with the landlord, you know, to get a cheaper rate just because I got this underlying belief of cheap and good. 
And that caused me to feel a little jittery. It's like, oh, can I get a better deal? Can I get a better deal? And when I thought about this, like, yeah, maybe I shouldn't waste too much energy and time and be so anxious about getting a better deal because it has already met my benchmark and met what I need, right? And what I was expecting to pay for um, given my expectations. So I thought that is something that is very important to recognize, especially for first-time renters because you have no experience, you don't understand the market. And of course, you use the apps, they will give you all the information. It's like, you know, in this area, in this estate, what is the average price? Just tons of this kind of property apps. I don't need to tell you any, but because of your lack of experience, because of my lack of experience and my this underlying belief of cheap and good, I felt very jittery trying to pay and commit to something when I always felt like I needed to get it at a more affordable rate. But if I'm always pressing prices and my landlord is uncomfortable and, you know, they just feel like they're getting forced into this agreement, then, you know, maybe not that great lah because you are, it's an ongoing kind of purchase, right? Every month, every month. And it's not a one-off thing that you don't need to really care about the sellers, you know, like uh, whatever lah. The relationship ends at the purchase. But for this, it's not. The relationship starts at the purchase. So in my view, after I thought about it, after this one year of experience, it is very important from a renter's viewpoint to essentially set a budget based on what you understand to be comfortable Probably somewhere in the ballpark of 10 to 15% of your salary. I think that's what some people say. So I spent about $500 sing to rent an apartment in KL. Okay, so that is that is my hack, uh-huh, my, my geo arbitrage, uh, as what the fire guys say. So set that benchmark, set that price, understand yourself and stick to that budget. Stick to it, right? Because it gives, it definitely gave me comfort to know that I've met my objectives, and I stop shifting the goalpost and always try to want to get a cheaper one. All right? To me, recognize that. As long as it meets your budget, recognize that renting a property is an ongoing purchase. Right? It is not a one-off thing. Right? So that is something for you to note. And the third point, okay, the third tip for you all first-time home renters is always get an agent. Always get an intermediary, okay? I know because for a lot of guys that are first-time renters, we usually have a tighter budget and, you know, we always want to save money and the agent fees can go up to a month, two months. And for whatever reason, you know, um, there's a lot of distaste for agents. You know, you don't like them. You always feel like they're eating you. Lah. They always feel like um, they, they're making money off you, which is not wrong. Of course, they're providing you a service. They're helping you to do certain things and they're charging you a fee, right? But I feel that as a first-time renter or even second-time, third-time renter, or even a home buyer, I would think having that agent as an interim helps a lot, right? I save on a lot of things. I can't back on a lot of costs, but property agents is one of these costs that I find it very hard to cut because they do provide very um, interesting value that if you've never transacted a property in any way, you will probably not appreciate this. So some people think that the agent only does the sourcing, you know, they help you find, you know, your place. And with all these apps these days, right, you can automate the sourcing and whatnot, which is not wrong. That is one part that you can automate. And probably, right, most of your agents are on all these platforms trying to source for properties based on what you like, based on what you're looking for, right? So that, that is that part about property, but on top of that, actually a lot of your agents, they do serve as the lubricant of the discussion, right? They can help you with like, you know, recognizing what is the market here and, you know, um, negotiate with the landlord. Sometimes they represent the landlord, they will want to negotiate with you, but it's important to have, you know, this intermediary to help to, you know, lubricate the discussion and lubricate the negotiation. So everybody gets, you know, that, middle ground to discuss because sometimes, you know, um, it gets a little fiery like if let's say you want something, you know, or, or whatnot. And also, you know, the agent's job doesn't end at just the transaction. Ongoing, they will service you. Like, I remember I have an experience of like um, my sink being choked and it was the first time I ever experienced a sink being choked. Um, and I was like, what to do? I don't know what to do. So, I could have directly reached out to the landlord and be like, what the hell's going on, right? But I instead went to the agent and asked him, hey, can you just help me sort this out, what's going on? 
And he came over to help me sort it out. And he was like, hey, let's say this doesn't work out. He will tell the landlord that there is a choke and they will need to clean up that choke. So there is that kind of aid in terms of having that additional layer of discussion, that additional layer of people being around to help you to mitigate this kind of um, slightly more complex situations because the reality is you are living in the landlord's place. They own the place and you are renting the place, right? So I don't think you want to anger the person that owns the place. Lah, huh? Let's be honest and real. So to me, that is one role that um, the agents do play and it's very important. Of course, uh, they have the legal you know, tender, they have the legal kind of uh, arrangement that is involved, right? They will ensure that the contracts are being kept up to date. They will ensure that the contracts are being met, right? So they do serve in the intermediary of you know, assurance and I think that is where future of agencies will be serving as the intermediary of trust and uh, mediation. All right, so don't be too happy when you go on Carousel and you see this thing and no agents, you know, or blah, blah, blah. Like, yeah, it will be cheaper, of course, because there's no agent fee. But I feel that because you're a first-time, especially because you're a first-time renter and you don't understand what are your rights, what can you control, what you cannot control, then pay a little bit of the fee to give you that, you know, interim of trust, assurance and mediation. To me, I think that makes your life much easier. While you're trying to figure out your life, figure out what you enjoy, what you don't, and just kind of shape your life, I'm sure you don't really want to be too bothered by all this kind of hassle and, you know, stuff. Lah. Of course, all that being said, feel free to change your agent, right? And right from the start, if you feel that the agent is not meeting your needs, they're not serving you with the intention, um, then definitely change the agent. Be, be happy and upfront. To, don't be paise lah. You know, a lot of Asians, a lot of Singaporeans, very paise lah. It's like as if the first first date you must marry like that. No, that's not the truth. Right? So if you don't like the agent, then change the agent, right? But I would think personally from my experience, even for my next few property that I rent or when I buy, I would believe that I need an agent to help me with all these kind of additional stuff beyond just the search, beyond just paperwork. It's really the mediation and the kind of trust intermediary that I'm looking for when I work with the agent. So to me, that is something that you should consider. So to sum up today, three tips for your first time home renter. Number one is I feel that you need to, you know, rent for a year, right? Not too long, not too short. A year is a good time to understand your habits, your preferences. And if you want to continue, so be it. If you want to change a place, so be it. Maybe after you change one or two places, you realize that hey, actually, I quite like the first place and you can always go back, right? Don't need to... Um, overcommit because it's your first time you want to explore you want to know yourself but of, of course don't undercommit then you keep shifting and very mahuan right you got to shift your stuff again and again and again and it is quite a hassle shifting house number two is set your budget set a budget that is comfortable to your way of life and you know stick to it use that as the benchmark don't be on an endless pursuit to find cheap and good cheap and good because there will always be better there will always be cheaper you know uh, it's an endless pursuit right why not stick to something that you're comfortable you know this is where you can and recognize that this is a, the start of a purchase it is not the end of a purchase because when you rent something you know that's only the beginning right it's not like when you're buying some vegetable out there on offer okay and point number three is that always work with the agent that you're comfortable, that you can trust, that can be there to do the mediation and be there to, for you to entrust. Right? So it is not just about you know, how flattery they are when they talk, but whether really you can trust this person to do these additional stuff of mediating and serve as an intermediary of trust. So I hope you learned something useful and I hope you find that first apartment of yours to rent and discover your life. See ya! Hey, I hope you learned something useful today and truly appreciate that you took time off to better your life with the Financial Coconut. Knowledge is that much more powerful and interesting when shared, debated and discussed. I hope you would share what you gain with people you love and I want to hear from you. Give me some questions and help me along with building our community of financially savvy coconuts. I hope together we can fulfill our curious minds and our desire for clarity. Join our community Telegram group, reach out to us on Facebook, Instagram, sign up for our weekly newsletter. Everything is in the description below. If you enjoy the podcast and if you want to keep us growing and stay independent, do buy us Kofi at Kofi.com. With that, have a great day ahead. Stay tuned next week and always remember, personal finance can be chill, clear and sustainable for all.
Test, test. Okay, I hope you guys learned some interesting stuff. Um, you know, keep your budget low. Of course, all those are those are good things, right? Lean down your expenses, blah, blah, blah. Those are fine. But these are real first-hand experience, you know, from me, from myself and my friends that have rented the place before, right? It's, it's not all about budgeting, not just all about technicalities, not all about like finding a place that's closest to town or most convenient, which is not true because sometimes you just don't want to stay too near to town. Sometimes you want to do that little bit of walk, you know, and all sorts of stuff, right? So, these are some guidelines that I think for a first-time renter, it, it's um, more realistic, lah, right? It's not like some, you know, yeah, lah, you know, some some advice are very questionable. But anyway, uh, I hope you learned something. I hope you can go and find your very first property to rent. So that's that for today and next week, okay, talking about cheap, talking about whatnot, right? Like how to reduce your expenses, huh? Next week, we have a person that's coming on the show that thinks being cheap is an insult, okay? Because he goes one step further to work for free, right? He's looking for free. So he is Daniel. Next week, we're having Daniel on the show and he will be sharing a, sharing with us, you know, his freegan movement, right? This whole idea of living in Singapore for free. Is it even possible, and when you live for free, do you need insurance? Do you need financial planning? What do you do with your life? How do you spend your day? You know, all these small, big and small things, we'll, we will chat with him next week. And of course, he's not a new guy, right? If you go on, you know, media and you search Daniel Tay, you know, freegan activist, uh, you, you will see him around, right? But he said that he had a good time chatting with us and probably have a lot of interesting juice that you cannot find elsewhere. So next week, we're going to have him on the show to talk to us more about his way of life, how to live without spending almost without spending almost nothing in Singapore, how to live a freegan lifestyle. So we'll see you next week. Bye, guys.